want you to know that I understand that, that I revere that, that I will never forget that. Tonight, Manitoba's first First Nations Premier will recognize Louis Riel as the province's very first Premier. I think it's been a long time coming. Uh, we've been fighting the uh, uh, two levels of government for some time now on um, past compensation. Plus, a century-old treaty payment dispute in Northern Ontario will soon be over. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's an honour. It's, it's amazing to be here. And two Indigenous artists are among those vying for a major art prize this year. Good evening, Tansi Anin. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Métis leader and Manitoba founder Louis Rial is set to receive the honorary title of the province's first premier. Manitoba Premier-designate Wab Kanu was at the annual meeting of the Manitoba Métis Federation in Winnipeg over the weekend. He said his government plans to put a bill forward this fall that, if passed, would give Rial the honorary title of First Premier of Manitoba. Rial's provisional government helped establish the Manitoba Act of 1870, which essentially brought the province into confederation. Rial was hanged for treason in 1885 after leading two armed attempts to stop Canada from encroaching on Métis rights. Canoe says it's important that Louis Rial is recognized as the father of Manitoba. Louis Rial and the Métis Nation are the reason that Manitoba is part of Canada. And so I want to, in front of you, his children, his grandchildren, his descendants, I want you to know that I understand that, that I revere that, that I will never forget that. On Sunday, the Métis Nation of Alberta held a swearing-in ceremony in Edmonton. The new, new Otipimsawak Métis government will be led by new president Andrea Sandmeyer. District captains, citizens' representatives and Sandmeyer officially began their terms after winning in last month's elections. m and President Sandmeyer addressed the crowd and told them some of her priorities. She replaces a longtime President Audrey Putra, who retired. The Otapimsoak Métis government is eager to further strengthen our relationships with the governments of Alberta and Canada. We are collaborating on a nation-to-nation -nation basis with Alberta and Canada to promote the interests and prosperity of our Métis communities. And we will continue to pursue economic reconciliation for our citizens. And we will preserve our Métis culture, cultural heritage, and improve the lives of more than 60,000 Métis citizens across Alberta. A teacher's aide at a local elementary school in Iqaluit, Nunavut, has been charged with four sex offenses against former students. Nunavut, Nunavut RCMP announced the charges late last week. 30-year-old Samuel Tagalik faces four charges r related to sexual exploitation, touching, luring and possession of child pornography. The charges stem from historical incidents which took place in 2018. Tegelik is expected to appear in court on October 30th. Police laid charges on September 25th, but announced it to the public October 13th. It's currently unclear whether or not Tegelik was working at the school at the time. Nunavut's Department of Education did not respond to a request to comment prior to publication. The Ontario government tabled new legislation today that will return controversial development lands to the province's greenbelt. If passed, the bill would restore the 15 parcels of land that were redesignated or removed from the Greenbelt and the Oak Ridges Moraine areas and enhance protections of, uh, of these areas to an unprecedented degree by making sure that any future boundary changes can only be made through an open, public and transparent legislative process. The Ford government has been under fire since it removed 7,400 acres of protected lands from the Greenbelt. First Nations leaders across Ontario had demanded the return of environmental protections and the province's Auditor General and Integrity Commissioner found that some developers were favoured in the selection process. Housing Minister Paul Calandra had this to say.
We want to hear what you think about the stories you've seen to start our show. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, go to aptnnews.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X, previously known as Twitter. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. A girls volleyball team from Chief Kakiwistahau Community School were involved in a serious motor vehicle accident last Thursday. The girls involved are in grades 8 and 9. The team of 8 and a coach were heading to a volleyball game on October 12th when they were struck by a truck on the Trans-Canada Highway near Sintaluda, Saskatchewan, about 87 kilometers east of Regina. According to the Saskatchewan RCMP, all nine occupants of the van were taken to the Indian Head Hospital with various injuries described as severe to non-life-threatening. The driver of the other vehicle that struck the van was transported by helicopter to an undisclosed hospital. The accident is under investigation. Certainly wishing nothing but the best and a quick recovery for everyone involved there. All right, a short break is upon us still to come. A centuries-old dispute over treaty payments comes to a close. Ontario is ready to go, ready to sign. There was a, a bit of a glitch with the uh, federal minister on, on when he can sign. Welcome back to Australia now, where 60% of voters have voted against the establishment of a committee called the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. The move would have created a special committee to advise Parliament on issues affecting Indigenous people in Australia. This was the first national referendum in Australia in nearly 25 years. We'll have more on the story in the coming days. The United Nations Canada held an event in Vancouver that focused the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. ABTN's Tina House was there and has this story. At the reception at the United Nations Association in Canada Model United Nations event, the British Columbia Regimental Band opened as dignitaries, business owners and non-profit workers honored the association's work. Some UN vehicles were also on display. Jamie Webb is the president and CEO and says this event is to showcase the importance of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We've got youth coming from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, BC, Yukon and Nunavut to join us here in Vancouver. And we're going to be talking about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, and we've selected six articles, well the youth have selected six articles that they want to explore in greater detail to come up with resolutions on what they would like to see the global community doing to further the implementation of UNDRA. And one of those youth is Brianne Mallets. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> I'm excited to celebrate. Um, I'm, I don't know, I'm excited to participate in some Indigenous-led discourse here. The keynote speaker is Aluki Kotirik. She is part of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and was instrumental in developing UNDRIP. UNDRIP is a tool, like so many of the uh, initiatives and interventions that Indigenous peoples from Canada and around the world continuously say, it's a, a way to assert self-determination. It's just to ensure that there's the space, that there is a recognition that as Indigenous peoples, we also have human rights to be who we are and to assert that and to be as, as proud as, of who we are as we can be. And on the red carpet at this United Nations event, that pride of Indigenous people is being honoured and celebrated. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. A century-old dispute in Northern Ontario over yearly treaty payments will soon be coming to a close. The area in question stretches from Perry Sound to Sudbury and North Bay to Sault Ste. Marie along the shores of Lake Huron. As Annette Francis reports, a treaty that was first signed in 1850 is about to get a major update. 
82-year-old Joyce Tababadong has vivid memory of the discussion over treaty payments as a child. When I was about eight or nine years old, my grandfather used to have caucus meetings before they'd go to Ottawa. And I would sit in the meeting and, and uh, make sure their water glasses were full and their ashtrays were empty, and I'd sit there all day listening before they'd, they'd uh, caucus for two or three days and then they'd go. When I was just young, but I remember that was the big subject, uh, the annuities. Uh, there was uh, nothing happening there. Her community of Wasaxing is one of 21 First Nations that are signatory to the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850 with the Crown. It set aside lands for each community while maintaining their right to hunt and fish and included annuity payments to individuals. The treaty also had an arrangement that annuity payments would increase. It happened once in 1874 to the current $4 a year, but no increase since then. After years in court, they are about to finalize a $10 billion settlement agreement with the federal and provincial governments. Well, I think it's been a long time coming. Uh, we've been fighting the uh, uh, two levels of government for some time now on uh, past compensation, uh, trying to uh, get what was uh, coming to us. Uh, our uh, members have always, uh, you know, kind of grown accustomed to the four dollars a year, but really never understood um, a lot of what was said in the treaty until this court case. The claim was filed in 2012. In 2018, the Ontario Superior Court ruled the Crown has an obligation to increase annuities and reflect the economic value it receives from the treaty area. The federal government did not appeal, but the province did, and after the Ontario Court of Appeals upheld the Superior Court's decision, Ontario filed an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. But it has since agreed to settle out of court. Ontario is ready to go, ready to sign. There was a, a bit of a glitch with the uh, federal minister on, on when he can sign. Uh, that's delayed it till November. But, uh, 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 you know, sitting down, coming with us on September 9th and uh, participating in our pipe ceremony was um, uh, a commitment to uh, to this settlement. In the meantime, community members are asking what this will mean for them and their communities. Chief Lloyd Mike of Magnetowan First Nations says education and community engagement is part of the process. Learning the treaty is a good start in that as well, and we've been trying to get that message out to the community and that and all our members. You know. So learning about the treaty and that as well, the questions that we always get back is always going to be about in regards to what's the PCD, right? You know, well, everyone wants to look at that as well, well what that's going to mean for everybody. And we're going to get there. For Padabadong, it's about time. I'm glad it's, they finally have it settled. Um, you know, there's talk about some people are not too happy with it. Some are, you know, some are, are but it's been... Uh, 173 years, you know. According to Chief Mike, once the agreement is signed, it will take 60 days for the money to flow to First Nations, which will likely be by mid-January. Meanwhile, negotiations on rising the annuity above $4 a year will begin after the settlement agreement is finalized. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. Indigenous youth are six times more likely to die from suicide, according to statistics gathered by FRAME, an organization dedicated to helping combat suicide and addiction. FRAME is a network of over 400 Canadian organizations that works with hundreds of experts to support substance abuse and suicide prevention projects. Six recently funded programs are grassroots based and run out of Indigenous communities. Akita Rawari is the executive director of FRAME. She says one of those programs is called Kitchen Talks, and Kitchen Talks is based in Yellowknife. They're really doing it in a meaningful way. They're making youth, they're empowering youth to uh, really tell them what they want to eat. What, are, what do they want to cook? What do they want to learn? And as they're doing those activities, they're having some really meaningful dialogues and conversations. All right, one final break is upon us. Photo of the day and weather are next. Plus, two Indigenous artists are in the running for the Sobe Art Prize. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's an honor. It's, it's amazing to be here.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. With the country well into the fall season, Clarence Jones sent in this amazing shot of the Hagelgit Canyon with the Seven Sisters mountain range in the distance, all from the Gitsan Nation. Thanks so much for that, Clarence. Make sure you send your fall and seasonal photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. And now, let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Beginning on the East Coast, 8 degrees in St. John's and 12 in Halifax. 5 degrees in Cartwright and 6 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. 15 degrees in Quebec City and 15 in Montreal. Ottawa is looking at 15 as well and 13 in North Bay. 14 degrees in Wawa and 13 in Sioux Lookout. Churchill's looking at 8 degrees and 12 in Puckettawagan. Some showers and 15 in Barron's River and 17 in Winnipeg. 19 degrees in Regina and 17 in Saskatoon. 12 degrees in Buffalo Narrows and showers and 8 in Stony Rapids. Continuing west, 8 degrees in Fort Chippewan and 11 in Peace River. Edmonton's looking at 12 degrees and 13 in Calgary. 14 degrees in Vancouver and 13 in Campbell River. 11 degrees in Prince George and 9 in Dees Lake. 10 degrees in Whitehorse and minus 1 in Old Crow. 4 degrees in Yellowknife and 6 in Fort Liard. 5 degrees in Colville Lake and minus 1 in Fort McPherson. 4 degrees in Baker Lake and 0 in Cambridge Bay. Minus 8 in Arctic Bay and minus 3 in Iqaluit. A new community initiative is aiming to heal and connect Winnipeggers through art. The eagle, when you look at the seven sacred teachings, the eagle represents love. And so this is really important, especially where we installed this mural, because the goal of this center is to show love to people. The Nadinawamak mural project is being spearheaded by its namesake and the Higher Learning Foundation. The goal of the project was to create three art pieces by Indigenous and people of colour artists in honour of truth and reconciliation. The works are being displayed at Indigenous-led Nadinawamak, which offers 24-7 warming in the city, making it a fitting location to house the new art. As you transition on the road to recovery, it's going to be that art, music, language, uh, and this just brings beauty into everyday life. There's uh, a lot of harsh realities about, uh, you know, transitioning uh, off the street, so this is about bringing uh, beauty to the everyday. The artwork features an array of themes including hum humility, the seven sacred ancestry teachings and spirit guides. Two Indigenous artists are among the five shortlisted for this year's prestigious Sobe Art Award. Both are guaranteed $25,000 each for their accomplishments and this increases to $100,000 if they win. ABTN's Fraser Needham has more. The five shortlisted artists were at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa for a media event on Thursday morning. Gabrielle Lirondel Hill is a Vancouver-based Métis artist and writer. She incorporates materials she finds in nature into her works. Things like tobacco and soft drink tabs, which challenge colonial concepts of the land and the economy. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's an honour. It's, it's amazing to be here. Luziak is a multidisciplinary Inuvialuk artist and curator who lives in Calgary. Their work explores the effects of modern pop culture on traditional Inuit culture. It's like I don't even know if I have words for it still um, to be part of this like amazing group of artists is, is uh, beyond words it's super special. Both artists work will be on display at the gallery until early March. The 2023 Sobe Art Award winner will be announced next month. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. As Fraser just mentioned, the Métis and Inu artists are shortlisted for the Sobe Art Prize. Seth Jones had talked with them both about what inspires their work. The 2023 Sobe Art Award has two Indigenous artists shortlisted to win the top prize of $100,000. A beautiful type of overwhelming. Kablusiak and Gabrielle LaRondell Hill are up against three other Canadian visual artists for the award. Métis artist LaRondell Hill says her work is tactile and is often described as delicate. 
materially, I use items for my everyday life, right? So they're, they're things that, you know, I like to think of items as things that um, pass through many hands, have had a life of their own, and maybe carry that charge with them. She uses art as a way to think with her body and to answer questions. Generally, I think of art as like a form of research, to, as a way of looking into and exploring ideas that I'm interested in. Her work is inspired by indigenous economies and how they continue to survive capitalism. So if you think about, um, you know, restrictions on hunting or fishing or being on the land, that's also a restriction of an economic practice. And in my mind, it's very intentionally, um, you know, part of a project to uh, the project of capitalism. So practices that survive that you know, offer an alternative and offer a threat, which I, I find very hopeful. Kablusiak is a queer Anuvialic artist. <laughs> they carve soapstone into cheeky objects and use animal fur to create nostalgic toys. I think it's a way for me to just like remind people that Inuit are contemporary and we exist in this current world um, and, you know, stepping away from archaic ideas of Inuit art and um, yeah, I blending that like pop culture and nostalgia and everything, it just is like um, a way for me to express and situate myself as a person who was born up north but lives down south. Leather and traditional Inuit art materials nod to sexuality in a contemporary way. It's easy to forget about sexuality and um, I think it's it's fun to bring in different notions into contemporary artworks. I guess bring bring attention to these issues and kind of normalize everything too. To be like, yeah, we are humans. We got here one way or another, and you know, there's <laughs> it's fun to acknowledge that. Kablusiak says exploring Inuit diaspora is entrenched in their work. It's definitely reflective in my work of you know, acknowledging this displacement, but also acknowledging that, you know, you could be Inuk and you could um, live in the city and you could make work about Garfield and it's still like Inuit art, you know? No matter who is awarded the top prize, LaRondell Hill says everyone's art is valuable. I think that there's this kind of funny idea in the world that that some people are artists and some people are great artists. And I I really don't think that's the truth. Like I think we're all, everybody's an artist and art is about the making and the best art comes from people. Sav Jonza, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Well, congratulations to you both on such a wonderful achievement and good luck. All right, that is all we have for you this evening on APTN National News. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. For all of us here, thank you so much for joining us. Miigwech, and ask you to have a great night.